first reading is from the Philippians. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law. A Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for the righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself, uh, myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me, heavenwards in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. I'm reading from St. John's Gospel. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burnt. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Great, so as we stand, shall we pray together? So Lord God, we thank you for your word to us given to us and handed down in the scriptures and the way it speaks to our lives even today. And Lord, as we look at your uh, word now, we pray that you'll speak to us afresh at the start of this new year. Lord, point us to you again and renew our spirits, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do uh, be seated. Great. Well, um, it's the start of a new year, as we've uh, mentioned, and uh, it doesn't happen often, does it? A Sunday morning on New Year's Day, uh, but every seven years or so, is it, I guess, around that? Unless it's a leap, leap year, I don't quite know how that interferes, but anyway. Um, yeah, not so often that we get to meet on New Year's morning and, and worship uh, together, but it's a nice thing to do, isn't it? Um, and often, New Year, of course, a time to reset and refocus um, a time to uh, rethink our lives a little, isn't it? 
uh, as we venture out on a new uh, year ahead. Uh, a time, of course, when many make New Year's resolutions. I don't know if uh, many of us here have made resolutions this year. It's not too late. I'm sure you can go away later today and think of something. Um, but, you know, it's a good thing to do, isn't it? You know, to re it's good to use any opportunity we can to reset, to refocus, to try and establish some new patterns in our lives. But, you know, the truth, of course, at least for me anyway, is that by February, at least by February, the resolutions have generally been forgotten. Uh, and we've gotten back to our old patterns, our old ways. Uh, so I've really stopped making resolutions because I just can't keep them very well. But anyway, that's just me. Um, but, you know, good ambitions, good intentions uh, often start at a new year, don't they? But often these good intentions uh, can't be carried through uh, so well. But I thought it'd be good to inspire ourselves today by hearing of someone else's intentions, desire, someone else's ambition um, how someone like the Apostle Paul resolved to live life and refocus his efforts and attentions. And that's why we had that great reading uh, from Philippians 3, uh, which Jeff read to us. And today we're going to kind of take a wander through uh, Paul's words to us there, uh, where we see that Paul's desire for Jesus is so inspiring, don't we? You know, at the start of the passage, uh, we read, that Paul had it all really before meeting Jesus. We hear that his life was pretty good. He was doing pretty well by human standards. But on finding Jesus, he realised that Jesus was worth giving everything for. Whatever were gains, he says, now I consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. You know, meeting Jesus had completely changed uh, Paul's life. It meant a complete reordering of his world. His life, his priorities, his focus had been completely uh, reshaped. Everything he'd rested on before, everything he'd leaned on and trusted in uh, before meeting Jesus, his history, his background, his pedigree, that meant nothing to him any longer. It wasn't those things that defined him. It wasn't those things he was looking to, to save him or to bring him fulfilment and joy. Now it was all Christ and only Christ. It was Jesus that filled the horizon of his heart. It was Jesus that was the centre of his world. But that isn't all, is it? In this amazing passage uh, from Philippians 3, because Paul isn't content with what he's tasted and seen already of Jesus. He isn't satisfied by what he knows already of God, but instead, He's hungry for more. He's hungry to grow and to go deeper. And of course, uh, here at St. Michael's, growing is one of our markers, isn't it? It's one of our uh, values, one of the things we've set ourselves uh, upon as a church. We want to be growing in number, uh, for, for, for one. We want to be growing together in, in friendship uh, and community. And of course, as well as that, we want to be growing individually too, to commit ourselves to growing in our faith and our following of Jesus, to journeying further with him, to being more intentional about following Jesus closely. And of course, the journey of faith that we're all on is meant to be a journey of growth. Uh, that other reading we had from John 15, where Jesus uses that vine and branches analogy, uh, we see that, don't we? You know, it's an image really of growth and growing as we remain in him, the vine, so we should expect to grow ourselves and bear much fruit. As we uh, remain and abide in Jesus, so we're encouraged to uh, become stronger branches as we learn to live uh, our lives attached to him, as we learn to drink and take our sustenance uh, from the source of all life, uh, Jesus. Apart from me, one of the things Jesus says to us there, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's one of the things we've got to grasp uh, as Christians. You know, at the start of this new year, it's worth thinking to ourselves then, isn't it? Did I grow in my faith and following last year? Do I start this year closer to Jesus than I started 2022? And if not, why is that? You know, what's getting in the way? And what can we do differently this year to ensure that we do keep growing, that we stay attached to Jesus, that we become more fruitful in him? Uh, one of my uh, favourite writers, uh, A.W. Tozer, uh, talked about complacency uh, so often being a deadly foe of spiritual growth. 
We get apathetic. We think, you know, yeah, we've done, we've, we've talked about Jesus. We know Jesus. But actually, compla- we get complacent. And that can stop us pressing on and growing in our faith. He says, ignoble contentment so often takes the place of burning zeal. You know, we get content with where we are, with what we've seen. But he, he talks of us having a holy longing after God. That's what we want to have. And that's what we see Paul has here, don't we? A holy longing after God. You know, Paul, as we've seen already, has already come to Christ. He's already given his all for Jesus. He sees his life as defined and fulfilled in him. And yet still he wants to grow in faith. Still he wants to follow more closely. Still he's hungry for more uh, of God. And there's three interesting things he says to us in verses 10 uh, and 11 of that passage. Firstly, I want to know Christ is the first thing he says. And it's quite a bizarre thing, really, isn't it? We think of the Apostle Paul. Of course, he knew Jesus already. He's talked about, you know, knowing Jesus, giving all for Jesus. But then he says, I want to know Christ. I want to know him more. You know, it's not just a head knowledge he wants either, but an experience, a lived experience of the living God. Paul wants to know Christ. He understands that no matter what he's seen of him already, no matter how long he's been following, there's always more to grasp of Jesus. There's always more wonders to experience. There's always more beauty uh, to adore. You know, it's always sad, I think, when people lose that hunger uh, for more of God, when we get complacent, when we feel and live like we've arrived in our faith. We're called to keep on pressing on, to have this holy longing after God, as Paul displays here, to keep on seeking uh, more of Jesus. I want to know Christ, Paul says, first of all. And then secondly, more specifically, he says, I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the power of God in my life. You know, that word power we've looked at recently, it's come up a few times. It's that word dunamis in the Greek, which is where we get our word dynamite from. You know, I want the dynamite of God in my life, Paul is saying in other words. I want to know that surpassing greatness of his power for us who believe, as Paul will say, uh, elsewhere. Paul wants to walk in the power that God gives, to walk in the strength that comes from knowing the living God, to trust that that same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us uh, by the Holy Spirit. You know, it's so easy to forget that, isn't it, in the day-to-day of our lives, that by faith, by God's Spirit living in us, we have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead within us. It's so easy to neglect this dynamite that God has given us so that we can about be about the things that he was about so we can experience and extend that fullness of his life and freedom but you know that's what we're called uh, to do to rely to learn to rely upon his power uh, in in our lives his power to change situations that that desire to look to him to break in supernaturally at times to pray for those healings and miracles to come in his in his name to see those strongholds in our lives and in our worlds broken down by the powerful name of Jesus. Paul says, not just I want to know Christ then, but I want to know the power of Christ in my life, in the world. And then thirdly, Paul goes on to say, and I want to share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Now, that's a bit of a harder one to grasp, isn't it? You know, we can understand why Paul might want to know Christ, why he might want to know the power of the resurrection in his life, but sharing his suffering, really? You know, how do we make sense of that? Well, one of the recurring themes, of course, in the New Testament, one of the surprising strains of teaching uh, is that the early believers often counted it a privilege to suffer uh, with and for Jesus. They counted it a privilege to be counted with him, to be aligned with him, not just in his glory, but also in suffering too. And there's two things about suffering, uh, just to mention briefly here. You know, suffering can be invaluable. It can be invaluable. Not always, necessarily, but if we use it in the way that I think God would like us to use it, it can be invaluable for us. It can be a time of refining us and growing us. A time when we learn to depend not upon ourselves, but upon God and upon each other. A time which can drive us to him and to make us more like him. Suffering can be invaluable if we use it and direct it in the right way. And the other thing about suffering is that it will be inevitable. 
You know, one of the things as, about the Christian life is that suffering is part of it too. We're never promised an easy life as Christians. Later on in John's gospel, Jesus will say to these same disciples, he's talked about being the vine and the branches. He'll say to them, in this life, you will have trouble. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. You know, that's some of the things that Jesus lays out to those who would follow him. You know, the particular challenges that life raises for all of us, that those challenges that are common to all, and the particular challenges that arise from us following Jesus, they'll come for all of us at times. But, you know, as Jesus' path to glory was a path that went through suffering, uh, so too will ours be. But, you know, as Paul says here, you know, that's a chance for us to grow, to develop, to, to build our trust in the living God. I want to participate in his sufferings, Paul says, to become like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. You know, of course, in a more general sense too, the reality is that we can't be raised with Christ, can we, unless we've first taken up our cross and followed. You know, we can't experience that power of the resurrection, both here and in the age to come, unless we first identified ourselves in his death. You know, Bonhoeffer, another great uh, uh, follower and thinker who followed Jesus into suffering as he resisted the rise of the Nazis in the Second World War, uh, once said this, when, a, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die, come and die. The cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering, which everyone must experience, is the call to abandon the attachments of the world. It is that dying of the old man, which is the result of the encounter with Christ. As we embark on discipleship, this life of following Jesus, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death and thus it begins. The cross then is not the terrible end that Bonhoeffer goes on to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Jesus. You know, at the beginning of our journeying with him, we must come and die uh, with him. In Christ, then, we're con to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. We're to die to ourselves that we might live for him. We're to decenter ourselves from our worlds and instead put him in the driving seat, to place him on the throne of our lives. I consider everything else loss, Paul says, because of that surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. And again, you know, as, as we reflect back on that reading from John 15, Jesus says something similar there, doesn't he? That sometimes a bit of pruning is needed and sometimes a lot of pruning is needed in our lives. You know, actually, sometimes pruning can look pretty ruthless, can't it? When we finish the pruning back of the bush, it can look a little bit bare and empty. We can be like, oh, no, have I done irre irre irreparable damage to this bush? But actually, that's how the life springs forth. That's how the new life and the fruitfulness uh, comes. You know, God like, needs and wants us to allow ourselves to be pruned by him so that the new life can come, to cut back the old so that his life can be born. You know, what are the things in us then that we may need to cut off this year or rather allow the Father to cut off uh, from us as we start out on this new year so that we might see that new life of God burst forth again? Paul spells out this sort of threefold desire and determination then. And I think it's a determination that as we start a new year, we can all take hold of and take with us into 2023. Firstly, I want to know Christ. Secondly, I want to know the power of Christ, that his resurrection. And thirdly, I want to even share in his suffering to cut back those things and to, to allow God's life to blossom again. But then summing it all up in verse 12, to the end, he finishes it all off, doesn't he, with, with typical humility, really, from the Apostle Paul. Not that I have already attained all this or have ar already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ to, uh, Jesus took hold of me. And then he says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. You know, there's always more 
that we can know. There's always more to grasp of the goodness and grace of God. There's always more we can experience of the wonder of Christ to press on into together. Paul has met with the risen Jesus and now he has this new focus, this new calling, this new goal, forgetting what is behind and pressing on to what is ahead. Called heavenwards in Jesus to know him more, to experience more of his love, to go deeper in his faith and his following. And isn't that a desire for us to hold on to too? But, you know, just as we finish, you know, it might be great and good to have this desire, this determination uh, for this new year. It's a great ambition and resolution for us to take on to, uh, take, take up ourselves. But how on earth do we do this? You know, how do we, like Paul, help ourselves uh, to live in this way, to actually get to know Christ better in this year ahead, to grow in our faith and following? Well, just briefly, there's just a few things that I think we can do together and there's things that we can do apart that can help us uh, in this year ahead. Together, firstly, you know, we can come together regularly to worship, to set our minds and hearts on Jesus again, to come on Sundays uh, regularly if you can, weekly if you can. You know, to put it not just as one of those things that we do when we can and when time allows, but to make it that first priority, that first thing in our diaries. Because it's so important to to meet with other Christians, isn't it? To inspire each other, to spur each other on. As one uh, New Testament writer says, don't don't neglect your meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but, but meet together regularly, encourage one another, come together to worship I once heard, uh, you know, you hear people say occasionally, you know, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. I don't do that kind of thing. But actually, you know, it's it's really important for us if we're going to grow in our faith and following to be attending worship regularly with others. Someone once described it a bit like having a coal in the fire. You know, if you you're a coal in the fire with other coals, you're going to keep warm. You're going to stay hot. You're going to keep on fire for Jesus. But if you take that coal out of the fire, It's not long before that hot coal starts to get a little bit cold and it's hard to stay warm on your own. You know, that's what we do when we come together. We keep each other fired up. We keep each other warm uh, for Jesus. So Sundays is one of the things we can prioritise in this year ahead if we're going to know Jesus uh, more. And then there's other things, midweek as well. You know, uh, pray with others. There's opportunities through the week to pray here at church, Tuesday mornings online or uh, Tuesdays here at at 10.30 or Bible chat, which meets regularly. Find those occasions to come together uh, with others to pray. Or you might want to set up a WhatsApp group with two or three friends to pray for each other, to send prayer requests or little songs uh, to each other or encouragements uh, through the week. Get others around you to journey together uh, with. One of the other things we're hoping to set up early this year is some home groups as well. So, you know, if that's something through the week, an evening home group that you'll be interested in, let us know and we'll get you uh, connected in with that. But again, just other chances to meet with people through the week, to inspire each other, uh, to uh, um, encourage each other along the way. And, you know, if you're someone who's still not sure, who still has questions, then come along to Alpha that's something we're going to be starting in two or three weeks on a Monday evening uh, here in church. A great chance just to explore and ask those big questions of life and faith, uh, who, who Jesus was and understand uh, together. So there's some of the things we can do together. But then apart as well, you know, we spend lots of our weeks uh, out and about doing bits and bobs, uh, don't we? And some of us might be avid readers. And if you're a reader, then I encourage you, maybe alongside your usual reading list, why not add a book about Jesus to your reading list for 2023? I've got a few examples at the back, some, some that I found helpful over the years, which over coffee you can have a little look at. But just books that inspire us again to reconnect with Jesus, to wonder uh, at him. Um, why not re-establish your prayer time or your Bible reading uh, time in the day? Five, ten minutes at the start of a day. Um, Or if you're not a great one for reading, then there's some great uh, apps out there, tools that can get us praying and and reading and hearing scripture. Lectio 365 is a great one to download onto your phone. You can play it in your car on the way to work or when you're on a walk uh, somewhere. There's other great podcasts and uh, playlists out there as well. There's lots of things that we can use to inspire us when we're on our own, when we're out into the world. So whatever then our preferences and our patterns, 
you know, that encouragement is to, to find ways this year of filling our horizons with Jesus again, to commit ourselves to pressing on him, uh, into him, to seeking him more, to growing in our faith and our following together and apart as well, that we might know Christ better and bear much fruit for him in this year and in the years to come, allowing him to shape our lives, to fill our hearts afresh and to change our worlds. And for his glory and his namesake, uh, we do all this. So shall we pray uh, together? Lord God, we thank you that you're the God who is uh, so amazing, awe-inspiring. You're the God who we can know, but we can always get to know more about. And so Lord, as we set out onto this, into this new year, we pray that you'll give us that desire, that hunger to, to go deeper in our faith and our following. Help us to fill our horizons and our hearts with Jesus this year, we pray. To grow in him as our vine. To bear fruit for him in our lives. And to be those that share your love and your light with those around us. So Lord, we ask for your spirit to fill us afresh. To move in our hearts and minds. And to lead us on deeper into your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.